we'd like to begin with our Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, today, I will have the opportunity to introduce our speaker, Michael Cannon, and then Ari will be introducing um, Greg Mathis. Um, Michael Cannon works for the Cato Institute, and he's the Director of Health Policy Studies. He's been described as an influential healthcare wonk by the Post, the Washington Post, I guess I should specify, um, Obamacare's single most relentless antagonist, and Obamacare's fiercest critic. He has appeared on ABC, BBC, CBS, he does many news things. His articles have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, as well as the New York Times, USA Today, and many more. Um, he is the co-editor of Replacing Obamacare, the Cato Institute on Health Care Report, and co-author of Health, of Health Competition, What Holding Back Health Care, and how, it, how to Free It. Sorry. Previously, he served as a domestic policy analyst for the U.S. Senate Republican Policy Committee, where he advised the Senate leadership on health, education, labor, welfare, and the Second Amendment. He holds a BA in American government from the University of Virginia, and an MA in economics, and a JM in law and economics from George Mason University. He is a member of the Board of Advisors of Harvard Health Policy Review, and he's from my favorite, beloved, Northern Virginia, growing up in McLean. Um, and we will turn the time over to Ari to introduce Greg, and then we'll get started. Awesome. Okay. My name is Ari. Thank you so much for that introduction. My name is Ari Sloan. I'm the president of the BYU Health Law Society. And I am delighted to introduce you to Professor Mattis. Uh, Professor Mattis is a BYU alumnus. He also received his law degree at the University of Chicago. After law school, Professor Mattis clerked on the Tenth Circuit for uh, Judge Stephen H. Anderson. He joined a large law firm in Salt Lake, and he also served as in-house counsel for a number of organizations, including First Health. Currently, Professor Mattis uh, serves as MC General Counsel for Intermountain Healthcare. He also teaches health law right here at BYU. And the position he will be taking in this debate on universal coverage uh, is that it benefits public health. So I guess without further ado, should we turn over to Greg Mattis? Testing, testing. Oh, awesome. So what a pleasure to be here. Um, it's obviously in very esteemed company. We really appreciate your being here on campus. And I did, um, I don't eat, sleep, and breathe this particular topic as much as uh, Mr. Cannon does, but um, I've been very impressed with my quick research into his sort of um, take on the topic. So great to have him here. And good to be here. I have some uh, sort of threshold matters that I think we need to cover first. Uh, and the first, of course, is a disclaimer. Although Mr. Mattis is employed by Intermountain Healthcare and teaches at the law school, the following remarks are his alone and do not represent the position, view, or opinion of Intermountain Healthcare or the law school. Take them with a grain of salt. In fact, make that a chunk of salt. They are provided as is and without warranty of any kind. Your results may vary. Please enjoy responsibly. Avoid where put it OAC. Any copy, reproduction, or misuse of his remarks while reading center of Major League Baseball is strictly prohibited. Not valid in 37 states plus the District of Columbia. Objects appear smaller in the debate than in real life. Use as directed. If the debate lasts longer than four hours, please consult a doctor. We good? We fully disclaimed? <laughs> okay. Uh, the second threshold matter that I thought was important to cover is um, this is really complex. There isn't a panacea to the problems that beset us in healthcare, including universal coverage. And I don't stand here as a proponent for that idea today. Uh, and say to you that it will magically solve everything. In fact, anyone who sells you a solution to our healthcare problems is exactly that. They're selling you something or they're deeply partisan. This is complex and it's, there's no one easy panacea to this problem. The last threshold matter, well actually two more, the, the, the next to last one is that as Hugh Molson said, I will look at any additional evidence to confirm the opinion to which I have already come. And, you know, put a little more specifically, ever since I learned about confirmation bias, I've been seeing it everywhere. 
Um, it is alive and well in this debate, right? We look at the evidence that supports our existing position. Healthcare is particularly partisan because it comes to some core issues about how we feel about the proper role of government. And the fact of the matter is, is that those battle lines are well drawn. And so it behooves us all to sort of do our very best to remember confirmation bias and do our best to keep an open mind and talk about the state of the evidence and recognize arguments on both sides. So opportunities like this, I really appreciate and love. So the last threshold matter I wanted to um, talk about, and it has to do with sort of this burden of proof, and Mr. Cannon has written and talked about this fairly extensively, actually, in terms of the evidence for the health benefits of universal coverage, is that research design in this area faces some fairly profound challenges. The first one is um, the subject matter. It's very ill-suited to interventional experimentation, the sort of experimentation that you would usually do. Scientists, it turns out, have a hard time uh, actually designing an experiment in which they either provide health care coverage for people or throw them off their health care coverage and then measure the effects, particularly not at the sort of scale that would be necessary to, to make it as scientific as gold standard experimental investigation would be. Tough to experiment. Usually uh, people are reduced to observational studies, right, to look at public policy changes that have happened and then try to correlate or assess causation based on what happened in the aftermath. And that's less than gold standard and less than perfect. The second thing is the complexity. Once, even when you're doing that from an observational standpoint, very difficult given the potential for a lot of confounding variables that make it very difficult to talk about causation, right? Did the Medicaid expansion in X state actually cause those favorable health outcomes that resulted a year or two or three years later. Hard to make those uh, claims categorically, and that's a significant limitation in the literature and the state of the science. And then finally, the problem of scale. It's very difficult to, when we talk about universal coverage, you're not going to find scientific data about that in the US. Wait for it, because it hasn't happened, right? Haven't done it. Haven't done it in any we're near the sort of level that universal implies. And so there really hasn't been that sort of study or evidence writ large in the US. The data is much more specific, much more confined. So the important thing that I want you to remember walking away from that, though, is that those design challenges do not mean that there is a lack of evidence. There's actually a great deal of evidence that universal coverage improves health. It's just imperfect evidence. It's not complete evidence. It's not the best or ideal evidence. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of comprehensive reviews of the literature, sort of meta studies that took place, uh, one in 2019, one just this last year, in which both sets of authors tried to gather and look at all the available literature slash studies on the topic, synthesize them, draw conclusions from doing sort of a meta-analysis. The first one is from Michael McWilliams in 2009. And the second one is from Summers, or Summers Gawande and is it pronounced Biker? Baker? Baker. Um, I know that Mr. Kennan knows these people because he's mentioned in the footnotes. They cite some of his writings in the study, and he obviously is familiar with both of these studies. Um, and what they, I found both of them very interesting um, because they're both, to my thinking, fairly careful, meticulous, even-handed, and they openly acknowledge, first of all, those research limitations that I just talked about. Data is not perfect. And secondly, the state of the evidence going both directions, right? It's not like all the evidence points one way on this. Like I said, it's complex. But both of those conclude in 2009, and again, just this last year, less than six months ago, that there are material health benefits to health insurance coverage. McWilliams said, recent studies have found consistently positive and often significant effects of health insurance coverage on health across a range of outcomes, particularly 
significant benefits of coverage have been robustly demonstrated for adults with active or chronic conditions for which there are effective treatments. In other words, for conditions that are amenable to healthcare is the term that's used in the industry. If you have something that healthcare actually is going to make a difference for, going to the doctor helps, then it actually helps to be insured. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that more in a minute. The second study in the New England Journal of Medicine this last August said there are many unanswered questions about U.S. health insurance policy, but whether enrollees benefit from the coverage is not one of the unanswered questions. Insurance coverage is, increases access to care and improves a wide range of health outcomes, arguing that health insurance coverage doesn't improve health is simply inconsistent with the evidence. And let's not check common sense at the door, right? I believe in an evidence-based approach to this issue. I believe in science. But if you think about it very long, having insurance makes you more likely to go to the doctor or the hospital, which provide, wait for it, medical care, which, although often imperfect in the US, tends to improve your health conditions. Right? We're not talking about a huge logical leap. Um, and those aren't surprising conclusions. And I want to draw an analogy for you, because it's all wrapped up in this, in this idea of what does the data scientifically conclusively prove. And the analogy is police presence. And if I were to tell you uh, or ask you the question, does increasing the police presence in a community reduce crime? That is actually a, a question which has been studied and debated, and there's a lot of evidence on it, and we sort of lay that out for you. Um, it's not clear-cut. Interventional experimentation is tough to achieve. It's tough for a group of scientists to say, we're going to go put an extra 10% cops on the street as part of our study. And then we're going to design a study. They don't have control over that. Not only that, they don't have control over a whole array of confounding variables. Just because crime goes up or down does not necessarily mean that the increased or decreased presence of police were causal. However, criminologists have done their best to study that, and the state of the evidence is some observational studies have found no evidence. In Seattle, the violent crime rate dropped by 44% while it reduced its police force by 9%. In Baltimore, where they beefed up the force by 20%, it didn't change crime at all. Having said that, despite those outliers, the balance of the evidence suggests that there is a link, that if you put more cops on the street, it's going to tend to reduce crime. Although causation, for the reasons I just mentioned, are hard to prove. That really describes the extent of the evidence on this debate. The balance of the evidence is suggestive, strongly suggestive, that increased coverage, getting yourself insured, is going to improve health, health outcomes and even save lives. So the conclusion, it's better in the boat, right, than bobbing around in the water. Why? People are more likely to seek care. The evidence of improvements, there's evidence of improvements in diagnosis and treatment of specific diseases, cancer, diabetes, other evidence that when you go to the doctor or the hospital, you get better. And there's dramatic improvement in well-being and self-reported health, in other words, wellness, your own perception of how well you're doing, which, by the way, is a validated measure for risk of death. How you feel about your health controls how healthy you are and whether or not you actually live or die. And there are numerous proven links between financial, mental, and physical health. And by the way, more objective scientific evidence is coming every day because the ACA has been this awesome observational experiment, right? A bunch of states have expanded Medicaid. The exchanges have expanded coverage. And more studies are coming in. In fact, just from when the New England Journal of Medicine meta-study was published in August to when they made some comments a month or two later, they, they noted that additional studies were coming on that were all, again, supportive of this not too surprising conclusion that increased health insurance coverage 
improves health. So the last thing I want to say about that, and I'm sure Mr. Cannon has things to say about it as well, is that you know, at scale, you can look to other countries. And you know, forget about, again, talking about some sort of a controlled basis, but it is a well-known fact that in other countries that have done it, and by the way, that's virtually every industrialized nation on the planet that provides health coverage to all of its citizens, the quality of health care is largely better than in America, which is a not understood fact, and the cost is lower. Those health outcomes are at least as good as in the U.S. for countries where everybody is covered. Everybody's in the pool. But, so again, that's, thank you, Captain Obvious. That's me at Halloween last year. I did that so I could walk around saying obvious things like health insurance improves health outcomes. Um, but the boat has issues. It's old. It leaks. It definitely has a lot of room for improvement. There's, there are documented quality problems with U.S. health care. Okay, that slide on the first, first page of my deck is actually historical. It's Titanic's collapsible boat D. And that photo is of it approaching the Carpathia at 7.15 a.m. on April 15, 1912. It was partially flooded with ice-cold seawater. I'm quite sure those people were not having a good experience. They were having a better experience than the people in the water. Again, not ideal, but would you rather be in this boat? And these are warmer climbs than in the water. I suggest to you, you'd rather be in the boat. And your own personal experience probably suggests the same. That from a health outcome, you suspect, and there is evidence to suggest it's true, that it's better to be covered and insured. Virtually any makeshift vessel is better than being in the water. And I'm going to provide to you gold standard scientific proof, which I don't think Mr. Cannon can even touch, right? I give you Rose and Jack. <laughs> now, for those of you who are not familiar with Titanic, <sighs> uninsured, covered. And spoiler alert, if you're saving the video for later, close your eyes, dead, alive. Very tough to refute that. Now, a few words about cost. Um, first of all, there isn't any free lunch. We, as a society, pay for everyone's health care, whether or not we insure them. Okay, cost shifting is alive and well, and we end up paying for their health care because it's required, and people get their care in an uncoordinated, fragmented way through emergency rooms rather than through preventive care at the appropriate level of care. The question isn't whether or not we're going to pay for people's coverage or, 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 or that they're going to get health care in America. It's going to, how do they get it? How efficiently, how effectively do they get it? And insurance improves the odds that they get it at the lower cost and at the right level. That is why 16 red states voluntarily chose to expand Medicaid because they knew, despite their politics, they were going to pay for it one way or the other and they wanted to insure their people. Now, as to cost, I have read an article in which um, Mr. Cannon, um, based on some extrapolations from studying what happened in, with Romney Care in Massachusetts, said that, yeah, it looks like the evidence is that it may save lives, but at what kind of a cost? And we should be doing a cost-benefit analysis. And in, and in Massachusetts, his estimate was it costs four or five million dollars for every life saved. And he rightly pointed out, hey, we should be doing an analysis of does that make sense as a public health expenditure? Are there other things in which we can more wisely spend our, our public dollars? And I just simply wanted to point out that the New England Journal of Medicine um, article addressed that issue and tagged that price tag at much lower, at between $327,000 to $867,000 per life. So really, I just wanted to conclude by saying this is, I think, we can talk about the state of the evidence. But I think it's really about a more fundamental disagreement about the proper role of the government. Um, and I just want to point out that universal coverage is not necessarily socialized medicine. You can still have private providers. You can still have, it doesn't have to be single payer or Medicare for all. Um, at its most basic, I'm just talking about having everyone in the insurance pool. Basically what the ACA very poorly, by the way, 
was attempting to do and has not done very well because everyone is not in the pool. Consider that ACA individual mandate, which has not been effectively administered, and I'm sure that Mr. Ken and I can agree on that. And it's actuarial science. If you spread that cost around everybody, you can accomplish it much more effectively. Um, we all share the burden. Now, Abraham Lincoln said you shouldn't always trust quotes on the internet, and he had a point. Um, however, having said that, I have it on good authority from the Twitter machine that Mr. Cannon has said, government is simply the name we give to the things we choose to do together. Now, in fairness, he said it facetiously, <laughs> I dare say. That's a Barney Frank quote. And I fully <laughs> understood that he was quoting someone else. <laughs> That's the awesome thing about the internet. But I think he, via Barney Frank, or Barney Frank via he, more accurately, has a point, <laughs> right? That, um, look, we have a socialized freeway system. Border security is socialized. If I, would I shock you if I told you we have a socialized military? <laughs> or probably most appropriately, education is socialized. We've decided it's a public good, that it's worth all of us paying for because of the benefits to society as a whole. And all I'm suggesting is that that's the case with health insurance, right? That it's up to us, we the people, to solve that public problem. It's not something government's doing to us. It's something that we can do together as a matter of public policy. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Mr. Cannon. Thanks. sides here, along the sides there, we've got this sort of lectern in the way. It's going to move in front of the table, but everyone see it's right here? Yeah? Yeah. Get that? Okay, good. All right, so thank you so much, Greg, uh, for that presentation. Uh, I want to uh, embrace not the idea of universal health insurance coverage. I want to embrace the idea of universal access to care. And, the, and making healthcare better and more affordable and more secure for people all the time. That's really largely what my work is devoted to at the Cato Institute. I just think that giving everyone health insurance undermines that goal. It makes it harder for us to bring healthcare to more and more people, more people tomorrow than than have access to it today. The way you do that is by encouraging innovations that make healthcare better that, and encouraging those innovations that reduce the per unit cost of delivering whatever health outcome you want, because when you do that, then it comes within the reach of low, people at lower and lower income levels. Okay, now that is different from uh, health insurance. Health insurance, yes, if you give someone health insurance, then that will expand their access to healthcare, but it also creates a problem. When you, uh, health insurance is very valuable because it can protect you from the financial cost of, uh, of, of an expensive illness. Uh, so it provides that risk protection. It protects you against the, the financial risk of uh, needing uh, expensive medical care, and when it does that, it brings that medical care within re your reach and you're able to access that medical care. There's also a downside to health insurance, though. Economists call it moral hazard, at least one downside. We call it, we call it moral hazard. It's the idea that when someone else is paying the bill, you're going to consume a lot more of something. And that happens a lot in health insurance. It's why health insurance has things like deductibles and co-insurance, so that you're at least paying for some of your medical care and not using it frivolously. It's actually really important that you not do that for reasons that, that I will explain. Um, but moral hazard can uh, not only encourage you to consume more medical care than you would if you were paying bills, and not just if, not just if you didn't have health insurance. If the insurance company gave you the money that it would have spent on your medical care, a lot of times people will consume less medical care than if they are insured, than if they have insurance, because they would make more careful cost-benefit calculations about, well, do I need this additional day of hospitalization? Or do I need to go to the doctor twice a year instead of just once a year? And they will cut back on uh, medical care, but when they're insured, they will go for that extra day of hospitalization. They will go to the doctor that additional time per year. That is the moral hazard cost of health care. Healthcare. When you consume medical care that you would not consume if you if you uh, owned and controlled the money involved, 
<coughs> Moral hazard is also a problem because it drives up, uh, because when you're paying with someone else's money, you don't care much about price. You want to know why hospitals should have these outrageous prices? Who, who here has ever gotten an explanation of benefits? And there's all these great big numbers, and then your insurance company does something to those numbers, and then all you really care about is this number at the bottom that says, here's what you owe. Because that, when you're doing, when you're balancing your checkbook, that's the one you have to worry about. But you probably, if you looked at an explanation of benefits that you got from your insurance company, you might have looked at that top number and thought, why, why is this price so high? And why did my insurance company pay so much for that, that, that those services that didn't seem like they uh, should cost that much? A big part of the reason is that not only are we uh, too heavily insured in the United States, in, a, in the sense that most people who have health insurance have more than they would prefer to purchase if they're spending their own money. Um, uh, but they're not spending their own money on health insurance. Uh, oftentimes, it's the taxpayers who are paying for your people, Americans' health insurance. I think about a third of the United States, or now maybe more, uh, uh, have their health insurance through uh, government programs where the taxpayers are funding that. Uh, what's the predominant form of health insurance in the United States? It's employer-sponsored health insurance. About half of the, more than half of the population have health insurance through an employer. Where your employer is paying your premiums, with your money, they take that money out of, the, out of about $13,000 for a family, uh, for, for workers with family coverage. They take that money out of worker salaries. The employer controls it. <clears throat> uh, they're spending it like it's their workers' money, not theirs. The worker is pretending it's their employer's money, not theirs. They demand more health insurance than they would if they were spending that money themselves. And it increases the price, uh, it increases healthcare prices. This also makes it harder for people uh, who don't, well, for everyone, but it's particularly people who don't have health insurance to afford medical care. And uh, it also, and I'll get back to this later, but moral hazard also has, a, has a, an effect on the quality of health care we receive. But I want to make uh, a, a really basic but very counterintuitive point about health care that bears on this question of do we want universal health insurance coverage? And I'm going to be drawing on uh, some uh, gold standard evidence with which you can't possibly argue, not quite as reliable as the whole Jack and Rose thing. <laughs> uh, no, this is a randomized controlled uh, study that took course over, the period, over a period of a number of years um, and had thousands of subjects. And it's generally well regarded, I mean, I think universally um, uh, uh, well regarded within economics and health uh, policy circles. I'm going to use that study to make a, a very counterintuitive point about really how healthcare is sort of weird. And it's weird in a way that uh, suggests that at a certain point, expanding health insurance coverage is not going to improve health. Okay? So let's go, let's go ahead and dive right in. And let's imagine, and, and the study that I'm going to, uh, I'm, uh, going to draw from right here was a randomized controlled study called the RAND Health Insurance Experiment. This was conducted in the 70s and 80s. And what they did was they took, this was not a study of giving people health insurance versus not health insurance. It's not a study of comparing the insured to the uninsured. They compared, uh, the investigators compared healthcare spending and health outcomes uh, for people who have different kinds of insurance. There were, I think, about Four groups. So one group had total comprehensive health insurance. The uh, they had insurance that paid for absolutely everything that they uh, all the medical care they need. Then there were people who had 25% uh, coinsurance up to a certain amount, 50% coinsurance, 75. I think it was, and then and then there was one group that had a deductible that was uh, a few thousand dollars. They had to pay everything up to that deductible, and then insurance took over and paid for everything. So you have people who are paying uh, different amounts for the health care they're consuming, and they wanted to, dis they wanted to figure out, because this was, this was conceived back in the 1970s where there was a big push uh, for single payer right on the heels of the Medicare and Medicaid program. A lot of people thought, well, if we just give everybody free health care, that will make them healthier. And so they conducted this experiment comparing people who got free health care to people who had health insurance with a, with a high deductible. And what they found was pretty remarkable. They had all sorts of health outcomes. And what I'm showing you is going to, I'm just going to put health right here on the, uh, on the y-axis. And down here on the x-axis, I'm going to put spending. 
Okay. What they found was that the people who had the uh, health insurance with a high deductible, they spent less on medical care than the people who had, we'll call this uh, high deductible, than the people who had 100% um, coverage. I'll call that FD for first dollar. In fact, the people with first dollar coverage who weren't paying anything out of pocket, they consumed about a third more medical care than the folks with the high deductible plans. So I'm going to say that I'm going to put that right here. We'll call that first dollar, or I'll make that. First dollar coverage, OK? And this makes sense. When you're spending other people's money on stuff, when you don't face the cost of your healthcare consumption, you're going to consume more. And it's true of healthcare, it's true of pizza. Those of you who help yourselves out there. It's true of open bars versus cash bars. And so this isn't really that surprising that the folks uh, with, who, who had to pay for more of their healthcare out of pocket spent less. Okay? What was surprising, what took everyone by surprise, particularly the advocates of, of making uh, having the government make healthcare free for everybody, is th that health outcomes were no different in this group versus this group. All this extra medical care that the folks in the first dollar coverage group got, uh, for all that extra medical care that they received, their health outcomes were no better. And they looked at a long list of health outcomes, including mortality and high blood pressure control, all sorts of uh, health events. And so let's, let's go ahead and say that the health for both groups was here. Okay? Do I want to do that? No, I'll make that a little lower. I'm going to make that a little lower. There's something coming up. Okay. So the folks here in the high deductible front, their health is right here. Which I'm going to their health is right there. I mean, that, and that's a remarkable thing, isn't it? I mean, health care on average is beneficial. That's, that's why, I mean, you know, if you want to represent that here, there's a slope here. Um, healthcare is on average beneficial, so how can it be that, that consuming all this additional medical care didn't make these folks any better off, didn't improve their health, okay? Um, let me make it uh, a, a little more intriguing or puzzling. Um, by throwing in the fact that the investigators who were looking at the health care that the folks in these two groups consumed, they couldn't see any difference between the health care that, that uh, uh, <coughs> the folks uh, that, they, that, they, uh, that they consumed. In fact, the stuff that the, that the patients in the high deductible group skipped looked every bit to them as beneficial as the stuff that, uh, at, that, the, as the stuff that they did receive. Okay, so as far as the investigators could tell, uh, the extra stuff sh should have helped. I want to suggest to you a way of understanding this really counterintuitive result. And it sort of bears on this question of should we be trying to achieve universal health insurance coverage? Because health care is kind of weird, okay? Inside, look at each of these dots here. Each of these dots is not just some number on the, um, uh, on the, on the y-axis, some number of dollars. All those dollars spent on all of these folks represent a huge bundle of healthcare services. Okay? This dot represents all the healthcare services that all the people in the high deductible group receive. Same thing for the first dollar coverage group there. And it's a wide array of healthcare services. It could be aspirin, it could be uh, annual physicals, it could be intensive care unit uh, stays, uh, uh, lots of pharmaceuticals, lots of uh, uh, surgeries. Uh, bones being set, and so forth, okay? Not all of those medical interventions are created equal, okay? Some of them uh, are more effective than others. Some of them purchase more help than others, all right? If you, um, uh, if you are able to, uh, save a premature child from dying, okay? It's a fairly expensive sort of thing if you're talking about sophisticated NIC views. Uh, but if you do do that, you are buying a whole lot of health, okay? You are buying maybe 70 years of healthy, productive life, all right? So the cost, so I'll just go ahead and draw this up here. 
let's say that this represents the cost of saving a kid in the NICU, you are buying all sorts of health with that, with that money you're spending. Okay? Same sort of thing is true if you're talking about very low cost interventions that are highly effective, like uh, controlling blood pressure. Okay? You uh, get someone on meds to control their hypertension, that's going to reduce their risk of adverse cardiac events. You're going to save a lot of lives doing that. It doesn't cost very much, you know, very little cost, very big improvement in health. Okay? So if we take these dots and we unbundle it. Oh, and, and other stuff, other stuff isn't very, I, I should say, other stuff. Uh, uh, that they might be receiving is, is that do, may not do much to improve health at all. Okay. Um, uh, for example, uh, the third time you go to see your GP during a year, I got five minutes left. Oh wow. Okay. The third time you go to see your GP during the year might not be all that beneficial. Maybe you are okay just going to see him twice a year. And then some medicine that people receive is actually harmful. If we, uh, and I'm talking about things like adverse drug events, hospital acquired infections, these things happen. Actually, they happen quite a lot. So if we unbundle all of this stuff and we line up each of those individual services that, uh, that these patients re receive in order of which were more cost effective, which produced the most improvements in health for the dollar, we're going to get a curve that looks something like this. Okay. A lot of those medical interventions are going to be highly effective and produce a, a, a purchase a lot of health. A lot of them are not going to do much to improve health at all. Okay, the slope here is on almost zero. This is what we call flat of the curve medicine, uh, because a lot uh, because some of these interventions aren't going to improve their health at all, and some of them you'll notice the slope is negative. It's going to hurt them. And these are things like your hospital-acquired infections and your, um, and your adverse drug reactions. We don't know what the shape of this curve looks like exactly, but we do know that there are these three categories um, uh, of health improving or beneficial medicine, uh, flat of the curve medicine that doesn't do anything to improve health, and bless you, medicine that actually reduces health. And so what this, the RAND insurance experiment suggests is that, and there's another curve for the folks over here in the first dollar group. Well, we don't know what it looks like either, other than it has uh, these three parts to it. And what the Rand Health Insurance Experiment <coughs> suggests is uh, that whatever additional stuff these folks are receiving, okay, it had maybe some flat of the curve medicine that wasn't affecting their health one way or the other. It probably also had a lot of beneficial, additional beneficial care in it that was improving health. But any beneficial care that those folks received was then <coughs> offset by the harmful care they were also receiving. And if, you, if it seems strange that there could be that much harmful care, remember that these folks are already receiving a certain baseline amount of, uh, the, the folks here are already receiving a baseline amount of care. The additional stuff that they're getting, you know, these folks are prioritizing and uh, going for the stuff that they think is going to be most beneficial. But also, keep in mind that the estimates of deaths in the United States due to medical error are really high. Does anyone know what the estimates are of, uh, uh, you know, before the Obama, we heard, uh, before Congress passed Obamacare, we heard these estimates about how many people die in the United States every year due to lack of health insurance. Anyone know what those numbers were? For a while, advocates of universal coverage were saying 18,000 people die per year in the United States because they lack health insurance. They bumped that number up to 45. There are issues with those numbers, but let's take them as given. The estimates of the number of people who die due to preventable medical errors in the United States at the same time was, uh, those numbers were being bandied about, were 48,000 to 98,000 lives lost per year. Okay? So the lower bound for medical errors was more than the upper bound for deaths lost to due to uninsurance. And since then, the estimates of medical error, deaths due to preventable medical errors have only gotten higher. Johns Hopkins University estimated that 250,000 Americans die every year due to preventable medical errors. That would make it our third leading cause of death. There are other estimates that put it at 400,000 deaths per year. And so, so what this suggests is that after a certain point, Medicine's dangerous enough that after a certain point, giving people more medicine, perhaps by expanding health insurance, 
is not going to improve health. Yes, it might improve the health for some of the people in that group, but there will be offsetting harms. This is at least theoretically possible. The Rand Health Insurance Experiment shows us that there can be offsetting harms that would leave the po population health no better off. And if you want to know why are there so many medical errors in the United States, look no further than my friend, Greg. <laughs> it is because of the pursuit of universal health insurance coverage that we have so many medical errors. Everyone can both decries and bemoan the, the presence of profit in medicine. People should be profiting off of medicine. It's immoral to profit off of people's uh, ill health. Well, the Medicare program, which is a universal government-run health insurance program for seniors, makes it didn't banish profit in medicine. In fact, um, uh, uh, private health care providers have been making out like bandits under Medicare. And one of the ways that uh, uh, Medicare preserved uh, profit in medicine, rather perversely, is Medicare makes medical errors profitable. You want to know why there are too many medical errors in the United States? Maybe it's because the biggest purchaser of health insurance or of medical services in the entire world actually rewards them. This would not happen in a market system. In a market system, there would be competition between different providers to try to eliminate medical errors, and I can talk about why that is. But rather than improve health, the pursuit of universal health insurance coverage is actually harming health, protecting the providers who are so sloppy that they are hurting hundreds of thousands or if not millions of patients every year with preventable medical errors. So uh, how, how much time have I, have I got left? Two minutes or three. So <clears throat> there are lots of studies, and Greg cited some of them, that, that if, you, if you look at uh, folks who are uninsured and folks who are insured, uh, <coughs> if you, there are observational studies that look at the insured and compare them to the uninsured, and some of them find that the uninsured, that not having health insurance harms health, others find no effect. If you look at quasi-experimental studies, they tend to find more of an effect, but those are hotly contested, okay, because of potential uh, confounding uh, factors like the variable bias and so forth. Uh, there have only been two randomized experiments that look at the effects of health insurance. One of them is the Rand Health Insurance Experiment, which I think suggests a compelling hypothesis about what's going on and why. Uh, uh, Beyond a certain point, expanding health insurance won't improve health. The other is the Oregon Medicaid experiment. It similarly found that uh, it found no statistically discernible difference between people who got Medicaid, these are low-income adults who got Medicaid, versus those who did not. Uh, it was conducted by actually Kate Baker and uh, uh, some other economists who did that review. I don't think that review was as responsible as it could have been, for one thing, if it's categorized my views. Um, so right there, I mean, they have my number. All I have to do is call. Uh, I also think it was not as careful as it could have been because they looked at their own study and said, well, okay, our results are not statistically significant, but the point estimate, while not statistically significant, is positive. So if we just look at that, then med expanding medical decay does improve uh, hypertension control and blood sugar and so forth. There's a problem there. And I'm surprised that the New England Journal of Medicine allowed them to put this into their, into, into their article. If you throw out the convention of 95% confidence intervals, well, then it's going to be the wild west in terms of this sort of uh, empirical research. And people will be able to claim all sorts of wild and crazy things that aren't true. That's why we have 95% confidence intervals. And I think they were a little too careless to throw them out. Um, this is what, like, pardon me. So I think uh, uh, that the most reliable studies we have, the Rand Health Insurance Experiment, the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, which is a randomized controlled study, uh, the fact that they, got, they came up with similar results uh, of, about the effects of additional health insurance, looking at two different populations at two different periods of time, that suggests that maybe improving uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, if what you want to do is improve health, you don't want to expand health insurance to the entire population because after a certain point, you're not buying any additional health. And I think it also points to the fact that maybe the pursuit of universal health insurance coverage is actually harming health in lots of ways that we could avoid. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, uh, 
Uh, very interesting. Uh, seven quick points. I will be fast. Number one, learned, studied different kinds of, wait for it, insurance. Nobody in the RAND study was uninsured. The entire playing field is talking about people who are insured, right? I'm all for people who are not insured getting onto the RAND chart. Number two, I am not an advocate for free. Number three, I believe in consumerism. Both of those are aspects of insurance design. How do you design the deductibles? How do you design the co-insurance, the co-pays? What sort of cost sharing do you have? There's a lot of, of evidence in consumerism that consumers should feel that pinch because of moral hazard. He and I are 100% aligned on that. Those are functions of insurance. The people without insurance don't even get on the graph. Number four, what his graph shows you what is this conversation about quality shows you is that the boat is leaky. This is exactly why I use that analogy. The boat isn't ideal. It has all sorts of problems. It isn't a reason to not let people in the boat. It's a reason to work on the boat. Let's reform insurance. Let's structure the right incentives. It isn't a reason to keep people bobbing in the harbor. Test for you. Based on what he's told you and what you know about, the lack of quality in American healthcare coverage, are you now going to conclude that you will stop going to the doctor and going to the hospital? Because you have a greater risk receiving medical care than not. If the answer to that question is yes, Mr. Cannon wins the debate. If the answer is no, if you still rather receive healthcare in this flawed system, it is not a strong argument to suggest that because the system is flawed, we should keep people from using it. Finally, Super neat trick to say that the problems in quality are the result from us trying to get to universal coverage. I would submit that there's a much stronger argument that the quality problems endemic in the status quo are endemic to that system in which there is not universal coverage. Very slick to suggest that the quality problems are linked to something that doesn't ha ha exist yet. We haven't even attained. I would love, and I think we're aligned on that, to solve those quality problems. Healthcare is beset with a myriad of problems. That's fixing the boat. I'm only saying, let's get everybody on board. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I can start with this. Um, what the Rand Health Insurance Experiment shows is just that healthcare is weak. Yes, it's not insurance versus uninsurance. But it showed that healthcare is not a simple matter of, oh, give them stuff and they'll be better. Sometimes it's give them stuff and they die. It's not a boat. If, or if it is a boat, sometimes people think there's a boat there and there isn't a boat. I mean, I don't know how, how we could construct the metaphor here, but if, if, if it's to be boats, I want there to be boats and I want them to be real boats. And I don't want to, people to just... Healthcare, if you want to use the Titanic metaphor, to some extent, there's so much uncertainty in healthcare and so much credence that you have to put in your healthcare provider. You have to believe in them that what they are telling you is true and will work. Then it's a little like asking people in the dead of night on a sinking ship uh, to jump off to a boat based on your promise that there's a boat there. I want there to be a boat there. Universal coverage is not about putting boats there. Universal coverage is just about the promise that there will be a boat there. Okay? And, um, and so no one is saying don't go to the doctor uh, or don't buy health insurance. That's not at all. If that were the case, these dots would be down here. That would mean there's no health to be had. No additional health to be had. And uh, this is only the health benefits of health insurance. Um, there's no debate at all about the uh, financial protection benefits of health insurance. The, the Medicaid, uh, uh, the Oregon Medicaid experiment found that yes, it does improve financial security. Health insurance does, and the effects are statistically significant. But if it's not improving health, you wonder, you know, do those people need to be spending the additional money anyway? Um, so no one's saying that at all. That's that that's a red herring. And finally, on the question of quality and the pursuit of universal coverage and its impact on quality. When you decide that the government is going to adopt a policy of universal health insurance coverage, 
it's going to have to do some, a, a lot of things to make sure that everybody has uh, uh, access to health insurance. Um, and those things are going to include controlling things like benefits, controlling things like cost sharing and the prices that insurance companies pay to doctors. These are things that people would otherwise, uh, questions people would otherwise answer according to their own values and preferences. The government's going to be making those for you. And most important, and this gets to the quality uh, issue, most important is that uh, the government decides not just how much to pay doctors and hospitals and so forth, but how to pay them. And what Medicare did was something uh, that actually the hospitals and doctors like a lot. Uh, the government had been already encouraging a type of payment called fee-for-service uh, ever since really ever since government enacted licensing of, the, uh, of doctors back in the early 20th century, even more so during World War II when the government uh, created a tax preference for employer-sponsored insurance that makes, that's created our employer-sponsored healthcare system, makes everyone more uh, amenable to a type of uh, 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 payment system for doctors and hospitals called fee-for-service, where every time the doctor provides a service, the doctor gets a fee. Provide another service, the doctor gets another fee. Same with hospitals. A little different with hospitals uh, since 1980, but we can talk about that. What the Medicare program did was, after the government was already encouraging this way of paying doctors and hospitals for you know 60 years, uh, Medicare came in and froze it in place and, and said, that's how the Medicare program is going to pay doctors and hospitals, fee for service. But the pro one of the problems with fee for service is that if the doctor injures you, it's still a service that injured you, so they get to collect a fee for injuring you, for giving you uh, uh, an excessive dose of whatever drug. And then the doctor has to provide additional services to you in order to make you better, and because they provide additional services, they get an additional fee. And so the Medicare program actually rewards medical errors in that way, and it's not that doctors are out there trying to figure out how they can make money by injuring patients. That's not it at all. But avoiding those kinds of injuries Avoiding those sorts of things, avoiding hospital acquired infections is hard. Avoiding medication errors is hard. It requires processes and systems and investments of money. And what happens if a hospital invests in trying to prevent unnecessary readmissions? They are out the money of uh, 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 that investment in, in preventing those uh, uh, unnecessary readmissions or the hospital acquired infections or what have you. And then they make less money for Medicare. <coughs> The Medicare pays them less for providing higher quality care. And there are examples of doing this. I think Intermountain is an example. Intermountain is bumped up against this, uh, this perverse incentive that has been cemented in place by the pursuit of universal health insurance coverage. And patients are the ones, these patients over here, are the ones who are suffering because of it. And in a market system, yes, some, uh, uh, some uh, healthcare uh, providers would be paid on a fee-for-service basis. Others would be paid on a capitated basis, which has the opposite incentives, and competition between the two would push them both to improve on that uh, dimension, on those dimensions of quality that I uh, mentioned, avoiding medical errors generally. So it's probably five minutes. I'll stop there. Thank you very much.